Welcome to this week's edition of World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley speaking to you from Washington, D.C. It's the afternoon of Friday, the 17th of July, 2015. Uh, and we have had a tumultuous uh, week. The struggle remains against austerity, but the struggle against austerity is a matter of political economy. And the question of remaining in power, of having political power in order to carry out economic policies, these are inextricably linked. So it's not possible to have a purely economic argument. You've also got to have a political strategy to go with it. And let me simply point out, uh, you never want to give up the initiative. You always keep the initiative. And in this case, the initiative means possession of a government that allows you to act. So keep power, stay in power, keep the initiative. Do not ever surrender the initiative to the oligarchical financiers and assorted enemies of humanity. So what we've had is the Greek parliament passing the admittedly odious austerity program, which has been extorted. But this is like saying the British army retreated from Dunkirk, not because they were lacking in uh, anti-Nazi spirit at that point, but simply because to stay would have been to be destroyed. Same thing with Lenin at Brest-Litovsk. You either make those concessions or you'll be destroyed. And in this case, if uh, Tsipras had not maneuvered in the way that he did, announcing all the time that he didn't believe in it, that it was extortion, and maybe that can become the basis of a court case somewhere sometime, uh, if you hadn't uh, done that, there would be no pr perspective for opening the banks. Now, the reason, of course, is that in order to be able to reflate the banking system with drachmas, you've got to be prepared for that. You have got to have the drachmas, physical drachmas. Maybe you can print those in China. Maybe you can print them in Latin America somewhere. Who knows? But you've got to have the drachmas, and you've got to have people who know what to do, who understand this principle of seizing the central bank, nationalize, requisition, commandeer the central banks. And unfortunately, Varoufakis, even though he was basking in the attention of the worldwide media for quite a few months, never seemed to get around to saying a few words about that. Varoufakis has neglected a great opportunity. He could have educated the world about the private central banks, their evils, why this system is not viable, must be abolished, and a few uh, ideas about how to do that with 0% or very cheap and long-term, if necessary, century-long, 100-year credit for infrastructure production, mining, manufacturing, scientific research, agriculture, and other tangible physical commodity production areas, manufacturing, not financial services. Financial services has, is overgrown, and the hypertrophy of the financial services must be released, re reversed, uh, and stopped, rolled back. So uh, at the end of the day, it looks like at the very last minute, Varoufakis pulled out, according to the interview with the New Statesman, which people should take a look at. You can find it through my Twitter at uh, Webster G. Tarpley on Twitter. I have linked to this uh, new, uh, new Statesman, right, the, the ultra-left bankers of London, uh, the, the, the left face of the, uh, of the city of London, ultra-left. Uh, so he came up at the last minute with the idea of seizing the Bank of Greece. But where was the preparation? Where was the training? Where were the teams? Uh, there's a whole series of things that have to be set up in advance. And it was, I think, a um, mistake not to, to do that. And as I said, why not invite me? Invite me over there. I'll give you a lecture tour. When I'm done with that, everybody will know, everybody in the policy area will know what it means to seize the central bank what does that mean? It's Hamiltonian. It's not even communist. You can defend this in any part of the world. So uh, that's, I think, where they went wrong. We'll, we'll be debating this one in, an, in a number of segments. So uh, it has passed. However, we've got uh, in the uh, ranks of Syriza, I think we've got 38 out of uh, 151 who have voted against 
the package, meaning that the uh, that majority is now attrited. Um, I would uh, urge those people to think again, right? They are right, they are cheek by jowl with the ultra left Radak, Radak and the ultra right wing Bukharin vis a vis the Treaty of Brest Litovsk. They are holier than thou, they are posturing. I want to hear their alternative. And why weren't they putting forth that alternative the whole time? Uh, and, and also, I welcome cooperation with them because you've got to learn the question of seizing the central bank. That's the only way to do it. Uh, it doesn't do any good to go posturing about how you want the end of capitalism. That will not do it. You've got to have an actual workable plan, which mine uh, unquestionably is. So we've just had some uh, – we've got a, a cabinet reshuffle going on. Uh, it means that uh, La Fazanis, the head of the left platform, the energy minister, is out, replaced by Skudletis, a closer ally of Tsipras, and the uh, social minister Stratulis is out in favor of Katrugalos. Katrugalos was on uh, the uh, RT today, makes a good impression. Uh, Katrugalos' um, comment was that the referendum served a purpose by stopping a soft coup that was being planned and executed uh, behind the scenes. So uh, an interesting point. Uh, so what we've got now is uh, a kind of a, a government that may be destined to last through the summer. In Rome, it would be a governo balneare, right? a beach government uh, for the summer only, but it may go on, right? And I would, I would recommend... If possible, avoid early elections, right? Early elections offer the reactionary forces the chance to run new scare campaigns. You've got, you've got a, a decent majority. Keep it. Uh, so we also ought to think about the achievements of Tsipras. I would say they are these. To play the United States against Merkel is an achievement. To break up the French-German axis on quite a few points to array France and Italy against Germany inside the European Union. That's a latent conflict. It's always been there, but now it's out in the open. Notice we've also got the IMF with Lagarde, not just the IMF, but Lagarde herself attacking the notion that, uh, that uh, you can block debt relief. In other words, playing the IMF and Lagarde and Schäuble and generally playing even Eurogarchs, uh, even somebody like Tusk, says that there's a uh, a need for a haircut or maybe he says debt relief I guess or something like that so uh, certainly in terms of the block right in other words the the monolithic European austerity block Cyprus has broken it up to a significant degree and in terms of the ideology uh, let me just note that the German press is in an uproar about Paul Krugman who has given relatively mild critiques of this austerity plan. Nothing like the radicalism of my plans, but they, uh, it, this is enough to get these characters going in the Frankfurter Allgemeine. For example, we have here, uh, Deutsche Ökonomen schlagen gegen Krugmann zurück. So <laughs> it is that the German economics profession is counterattacking Krugmann uh, and, and saying, no, this is all wrong, what you're up to. One of them is actually insulting. He says, this is your business model, Krugman. This is how you, uh, you get um, you know, uh, your gate receipts, right? Yes, how you make money. Um, Krugman says, who believes in Germany's good intentions? I'm afraid that's a widely posed question, but they seem to think that that is... Uh, is, is wrong. That's, that's uh, out of bounds. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C., 17th of uh, July. Best wishes to the uh, Muslim friends of the broadcast who are now completing uh, Ramadan and Eid, and best wishes, of course, to Madame La France with the 14th of July having uh, come this uh, this past week. So the German economists are raving against uh, Krugman. Krugman uh, has endorsed the 
this is a coup hashtag. Fine. Uh, it's a coup. I always ask, what are you going to do about it? How about seize the central banks? That would be a hashtag. Try that. Right? Nationalize the Fed. Requisition the ECB, European Central Bank. But the Germans go crazy over this. In other words, the German uh, economics ideologues, right? They're a meretricious profession. Look that one up, meretrix in the Latin, uh, and you'll see what that in, in implies. So uh, at the same time, we want to, again, note the achievements of Tsipras. Unfortunately, those achievements are still in the superstructure, so to speak, right? Those are up there in terms of, uh, you know, the, the power blocks. That is not going to uh, make this terrible austerity any any easier. But look, this is not over, huh? This is not over, and people should be fighting instead of whining and complaining. Here's what we find. In the Frankfurter Allgemeine, which is sort of the, the you know, the world journal of uh, the, the, the house organ of the austerity ghouls, of Europe, right? It's their flagship paper, the Frankfurter Allgemeine, the FATS. So uh, they are concerned that if there is a haircut, and they write this, uh, that if the haircut occurs and it's substantial, there will be no way to coerce Greece to respect the austerity conditions. They won't be respected. Yeah, that's that's an obvious point. If all Greeks hate these odious austerity uh, uh, conditions, then it will become very difficult to impose them, won't it, without some kind of peacekeeping force or military occupation. And I'm sure some people are, are thinking about going that route. But uh, I would say evade, prevaricate, temporize, falsify, deceive – because this was under duress. This was extorted under duress, genocidal duress. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me also do the, the comparison here in those terms. Um, the comparisons uh, uh, of the current uh, German regime again. Uh, the, uh, mm, let's see, uh, pre-Munich, right? Remember Hitler uh, met with the Lord Chamberlain uh, at Bechtesgaden, down way, way south Germany, and they made this deal that uh, that there would be a certain procedure for delivering the Sudetenland to Hitler. There was going to be some kind of a vote or whatever it was. And then after Chamberlain had gone back to London, gotten everybody on board, gotten the French on board, Chamberlain then flew to Bad Godesberg and said to Hitler, look, I've, I've got all that. And Hitler says, that's not good enough anymore. So notice this is what they did. There was a, a, an offer. And then the, the Eurogarchs said, there's a referendum. And then the Eurogarchs come back saying, that's not good enough anymore. It's got to be more austerity. So the Eurogarchs are actually imitated Hitler's pre-Munich diplomacy. You can read about this in William L. Shire, many other things. How about the beating up of Varoufakis and, and indeed of Tsipras, right? This reminds us of the, the, the prime minister of the Czech rump state was uh, invited <laughs> to Berlin in March, I believe, March 1939, and uh, told, you're going to sign away your country. And the guy actually had a heart attack, and they bullied him and badgered him and harried him until he signed it. So that is something that went off. Uh, Varoufakis, Varoufakis, you got to fix your historical uh, comparisons. Versailles is not harsh enough to describe what's going on. It's Brest-Litovsk. But then Brest Litovsk makes you look rather bad because once again you're sitting there with Radak and Bukharin and these other uh, people. So uh, this is uh, happening. The German Bundestag has voted to implement this thing. It's something like uh, out of almost 600 in the Bundestag, this got about 419 votes, if I heard correctly. Voting against are 60 to 65 of Merkel's own party, the CDU-CSU, plus uh, some, I, I think, welcome comments from Die Linke, right? Die Linke, that's Gregor Gysi, who is the guy left over from East Germany. Gysi stands up and tells Schäuble, you are destroying Europe, certainly true. And uh, our sentimental favorite, Sarah Wagenknecht of the 
uh, of Die Linke. Um, Merkel repudiated Schäuble in this debate. She said, some people talk about a timeout. That's what Schäuble is talking about in every interview now, a timeout. And she said the timeout would not be an orderly process of reorganization. It would be an uncontrollable chaos. Okay, Merkel, good for you on that one. So she's repudiated and contradicted Schäuble. Schäuble himself, I think if you look at those films, you will see he is ready to be institutionalized. He should be in the hospital. He should be in the nerve clinic. He should be in a psychiatric ward, gesticulating, hissing, raving. That's a very, very sick guy. I actually have a proposal for him. Uh, we've had the, uh, the original movie was Grumpy Old Men. Then we had Grumpier Old Men. How about uh, a, a, a sequel to those Grumpiest Old Men? Sony Pictures, script from the Rand Corporation. And Schäuble could be uh, the star. Uh, remember, there is no collective guilt. There's no collective guilt for Germany in the World War II. There's no collective guilt for Germany today, nor for U.S. or, or anybody. But uh, you've got to get out there and fight against these people, right? Schäuble raus. That's our hashtag. Hashtag Schäuble raus. S C H A. Umlaut, if you have it, otherwise an E after the A-U-B-L-E, capital R-A-U-S, out with him, go home. Merkel also, something of a monster, right, in her program called Gut Leben in Deutschland. So how to live well in Germany. She's got a group of 14 to 17-year-olds, a poor teen girl, Palestinian from Rostock, right, the old DDR, and her family is going to be deported, and she's going to be deported. And all Merkel can say is, we can't take everybody. I'm sorry. This is heartless. So she deserves it. Bad karma for you, Merkel. <laughs> I guess we can make these concessions. This is a purely rhetorical concession, right? I don't, I don't follow that theory, but you get the idea. Now, the IMF says a haircut is needed. Lagarde says the Greek debt has to be sustainable. Draghi of the European Central Bank says debt relief is needed. And we'll be talking about this in some more segments. Back in a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. This is Webster Tarpley reporting from Washington, D.C. We're going to get back to Greece uh, and related uh, questions in a little while, but... Uh, today does mark the uh, first anniversary of the tragic crash of Malaysian Airlines flight MH17 near Torres in Ukraine. And of course, today we are being subjected to a propaganda barrage by the controlled media. And we just had the France 24 correspondent in Torres saying there's a growing international consensus that this was done by the uh, by the uh, Donetsk People's Republic, in effect, uh, with the help of a Russian-made Buk uh, missile. So we've also had Por Poroshenko, or Pornoshenko as we call him, uh, with a uh, an attempted uh, dramatic appearance and empathy, but uh, it didn't work. So what we thought it would be good to get an antidote to all that. And we wanted, therefore, to go to Moscow and our good friend Stanislav Bishak, who is uh, somebody who works with the election monitoring agency of the Commonwealth of Independent States in Moscow. And he is the author, co-author of uh, one of the principal books about the uh, neo-fascist character of that Maidan movement and therefore of the government that, that came out of it. So... Welcome, Stanislav Bishak. We're, we're so glad to have you again. Oh, hi, Webster. Hi, Webster. It's great to be here again. Okay, so you, you've you seen this, uh, this propaganda campaign. Uh, what's the view from Moscow? Well, uh, the view from Moscow is the same, that let the judges, let the specialists decide who is to blame. But the uh, problem is that, uh, you know, the uh, Western media 
uh, for a year now uh, has uh, uh, already uh, known who is to blame just the same day uh, when this uh, tragic uh, event uh, uh, appeared they have already uh, they had already known that it's Russia which which is to blame or Russia or pro-Russian uh, rebels, pro-Russian separatists, as they call them. So uh, it's uh, it's it's a part of uh, uh, a greater, uh, wider uh, propaganda campaign that they say something like, uh, well, uh, we uh, don't know for sure because we're not specialists, but come on, well, we know who did it. Come on, we know it. You know, <laughs> it's something like this. By the way, uh, it's it reminds me the uh, tragic uh, death of uh, uh, Russian uh, opposition patriarch uh, Boris Nemtsov because uh, uh, I was the, the time after his death uh, I was uh, searching and observing the uh, Western media coverage of his tragic death and uh, it was the same that well okay we know that there are. Uh, there are uh, several versions of his death, but 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 come on, we 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 both know uh, who did it. Come on, well, it it was the same thing. It was uh, awful, uh, disgusting, but uh, uh, you know, uh, I think um, uh, uh, Joseph Goebbels uh, would uh, uh, would would be uh, would be grateful to have uh, such kind of uh, such kind of uh, employees in his uh, a propaganda agency. You know. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and I think you're uh, you're in the right direction. We we always try to use this cui bono, cui protest, right? Who benefits? Yeah. And if you do the who benefits analysis, this is all complete. The the come on argument is is all uh, nonsense. But now, since we did have Pornoshenko out there trying to do a dramatic uh, performance, um, what can you tell us uh, about conditions inside? Ukraine. Uh, how is it going? What's what's the what's the situation uh, with the Donetsk People's Republic, which we're interested in following, and Lugansk People's Republic, and and, and but uh, what's with with Kiev these days? Well, uh, uh, Kiev is in troubles, obviously, and uh, the thing is that uh, a year ago uh, the economy uh, was uh, uh, at the same. Uh, uh, at the same uh, bad and uh, uh, somewhat, uh, you know, swampy uh, condition, but the people had uh, somewhat uh, uh, some enthusiasm after this uh, Euromaidan, after this coup. Uh, a lot of people in Ukraine. I cannot uh, uh, say about uh, this about the majority or well, the, the, a lot of a lot of people were quite enthusiastic and they uh, they uh, behaved in a way that. Well, come on, we have we have to, uh, you know, we have to be strong for a couple of months or for 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 half a year, and we'll live uh, great just as a as a newborn European child or something like this. But uh, after a year and a half of this. Uh, of this turmoil, of this war, of this uh, uh, ending economic crisis, because there are uh, the, the the situation there in in uh, economic way is uh, uh, is getting worse and worse, and so now people, you know, begin uh, asking questions: uh, What did we? Uh, uh, fight for what did we we die for? What did uh, why uh, should we uh, uh, why should we continue this war, which is uh, which which has no uh, particular reasons, which is which has no clear reasons, but the uh, people still still die, still suffer, and so on and so forth. And uh, if we uh, if we uh, move on to to the uh, to the newborn uh, Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics. Well, uh, sure, uh, sure, the situation there is uh, somewhat uh, is somewhat different uh, than it's in Ukraine because uh, I know on the one hand, yes, they have a shortage of uh, some uh, of some goods. Uh, uh, they have uh, uh, de facto uh, de facto uh, martial law, but at the same time, they still have they still have hope 
for a better future uh, with uh, Russia as part of Russia or as a allied state with Russia. And so uh, uh, now people there are more, uh, well, uh, so to speak, more uh, optimistic about their future. Uh, and uh, after a year and a half of this war, they don't... Uh, don't want, uh, it's absolutely clear, they don't want to be part of Ukraine because, come on, uh, after this, all these uh, deaths, uh, sorrow, tragedies, uh, which came from, uh, from from Kiev, they ask themselves and they ask uh, Kiev, uh, why should we be a part of this country which has bomb constantly bombed us? which uh, uh, have constantly uh, blamed us on everything, called us uh, separatists, uh, called us, well, some, uh, some uh, derogatory uh, terms and so on and so forth. So that's, that's the situation there. I think you're, you're right. And that, that is what I saw. I was actually there on May 11th for their, their first anniversary of Independence uh, Parade. Now, yeah. I should have mentioned before um, the, this question that is flared up in the West about the presence of a second plane uh, in the MH17 case and how the BBC had eyewitnesses saying there was a second plane and how they, the BBC put that on the air and then sanitized it, right? They canceled it, expunged it from their, their video archive. So... Uh, if possible, we're gonna we're gonna link to that on our on our website, so you can see that there are all kinds of problems with the um, with the official version. And other than that, uh, maybe the last question: How are things in uh, Moscow? It looks like the the so-called economic sanctions have have had less and less effect, and actually, some there have been some positive reactions to to this. In other words, uh, it's sometimes a blessing in disguise. Well, uh, in fact, it's uh, it's not uh, it's not a black and white situation, so it's complicated. Uh, on the one hand, yes, we uh, uh, we uh, we are doing quite well. I mean, okay. So welcome back to World Rights Radio. We have been talking about Greece in our first two segments, but now we want to go directly to Athens and uh, and get the lowdown from our. Uh, observer there. Now, uh, there's been a whole lot of stuff, right? People remember the 17-hour overnight extortion and blackmail session in Brussels with the Eurocrats and Eurogarks extorting this austerity deal from Tsipras, as he uh, correctly uh, announced to the people. So that's an austerity deal uh, that has now been approved by France, by Germany, by the Greek parliament itself. We've also had the reshuffle of the uh, cabinet in Athens, uh, we've had, uh, you know, and the anarchists were out with violent demonstrations and the forest fires. So let's let's see uh, how Michael Chiotinas in Athens can uh, can put this all in perspective for us. Michael, welcome. Hello. Uh, two things, two big things to report on. Uh, one is the reshuffling. The other is the forest fires, as you said. Uh, in Let's start by what you said about the um, uh, the Euro summit. No, yes, the seventeen uh, hours of extortion, blackmail, and threats, and the votes, and the, the votes on Parliament. Yes, right. Uh, European Parliament and the Greek Parliament. The thing we have to stress here is that these were not votes on the uh, the, the deal itself. Right. Uh, they were votes. So that uh, the the parliament give authority to the ministers to negotiate. So the right. deal is not there yet. We have to see what the deal might be if there were there is going to be a deal because because there's a, an attempt to destabilize Greece, as I said. So let's go to these uh, two events. Michael, let me just on the destabilization. Let me just ask you on, on Russia today. Earlier, we had this guy uh, who's now been uh, promoted, right? Uh, Katrugalos told RT yeah. that the, the, the advantage of the referendum was to prevent a soft coup that was being carried out. Is that, does that ring a bell? 
I have I haven't seen it. I should see it first to see what he's talking about. He doesn't say uh, anything more than soft coup, a soft coup, a but soft, a coup. I don't know. I I don't know. He may maybe he talk, he's talking about a, an extorted change of government to a, yeah. to a government with all the parties of parliament. Maybe or technicians, right? Technicians. Yeah. Oh, technocrats, yes. Uh, but destabilization is on, and one one thing, uh, the, the one uh, part of the destabilization is the bill itself, is the agreement itself, which is, in my view, designed to break up Syriza because no one uh, could expect, no one expected the left platform, the internal opposition inside Syriza, left wing opposition to vote for it. Um, and the other thing is the forest fires. Now, about the reshuffling, what we need to say, in short, is that it had to do mostly with removing every MP or member of Syriza that had to do with, the, with this left platform, opposition, from positions, uh, to remove them from positions of responsibility and power. The, the left platform, indeed, did not vote for the bill that had to do with the new, the new austerity and the new bailout. And the big trouble for Tsipras remains the, the Speaker of Parliament, a woman named Zoe Konstantopoulou. She also didn't vote for the bill. She cannot be removed by the Prime Minister unilaterally. She has, she has declared she's not resigning. And the only way she can be removed is uh, a motion has to be done again, against her by Parliament and she has to be voted down. Uh, we have to see about that. So the government is being destabilized by this agreement. Tsipras was blackmailed to sign. Uh, Varoufakis his, himself did not, didn't vote for it. Um, he's the resigned uh, finance minister, the, the notorious guy. Right. Everybody knows him. Now, Tsipras is trying to bring back stability to the government with the, with the reshuffling. He has help of, of all people from the coalition partner, the right-wing coalition partner, Anel, and their leader, Kamenos. He says, we were, extort we were blackmailed, but we have to keep this government going. Many of the new members of the cabinet are Anel MPs. But at the same time, what's going on, um, that this is going on, we had today a huge number of forest fires breaking out simultaneously. And here's the interesting thing, is that the last time this happened, we, we, we have in Greece every summer forest fires, but the last time uh, this coordinated, simultaneously um, breaking out uh, thing with more than 45 fronts of fire breaking out simultaneously, the last time this happened was 2007. It was the summer just two or three months after uh, the then Prime Minister Karamanlis signed the pipeline with Putin, with Russia. <laughs> So we, we, we had now the coalition partner, Kamenos, who is the minister of uh, the defense minister. He sent out the armed forces he, to patrol forest areas and areas of dense vegetation near cities. And uh, I was informed, uh, as I was informed today, many of the observation towers positioned at various places on Mount Imitos, the mountain in the suburban area of Athens. These observation towers were vandalized a month ago by unknown people. The fire department didn't have the funds needed to restore them, of course, because of austerity. There have been cuts, even at civil protection, force, civil protection uh, forces and agencies. So this is, in my view, uh, another attempt at destabilization may be having to do with uh, foreign intelligence. Um, the, the, these two are the main uh, thing that we had to report. I had to report the for uh, report today. Report on. So the uh, the forest fires may be a component of a deliberate chaos and confusion strategy. In other words, some kind of additional ingredient that seemingly has nothing to do with debt or austerity, but which increases the general level of nervousness or uh, anger or resentment or whatever it is. Exactly, exactly. 
Okay. Um, with the, the destabilization of the political system, because you lose, um, you, it's, it's psychological warfare, first of all, and then having to do with economic, thing, uh, economic um, implications, because in 2007, uh, it was a disaster because big, huge areas burned down where, uh, with agricultural areas, olive trees, the, the thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands um, of, all, of olive trees and agric agricultural areas. And this was a huge economic disaster back in 2007. Hmm. Now, um, concerning this, uh, maybe you, you tell us how this is all being seen, right? We now have um, Draghi of the European Central Bank says there has to be debt relief. We've got Lagarde, even personally, of the IMF saying there has to be debt relief. The IMF staff has that report. There has to be uh, debt relief, right? The U.S. has said it. Uh, the French have said it. Vals of France. Um the, the FATS, right, the Frankfurter Allgemeine, is very much afraid that if debt relief is granted, that this will facilitate the Greek um, non-compliance, right, non-fulfillment of whatever has been agreed on. And I just wonder, what does the people comment in there about this foreign debate about debt relief? No, this is this is uh, this is nothing to do with actual political. Um with actual pol politics happening right now in Europe, it's the same old story about the moral hazard. It has nothing to do with, it, with anything, uh, in my view. The debt restructuring thing, the debt haircut has a lot to do, I think, with um, not giving a deal, not coming to a deal, uh, sabotaging any deal. Uh, because you, you, you can't have a haircut at the member, when you're a member of the Eurozone, uh, so then maybe you're not. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Michael. We've run out of time. There's our music. We'll see you next week. Welcome to the second hour of World Crisis Radio. It's Friday, the 17th of July. Now, we want to go quickly to get a report from America's most famous political air attacks and that is of course reverend edward pinckney who is in uh, Coldwater, michigan held in the rick snyder uh, jails and uh, under the uh, jurisdiction of aramark and their terrible abuses reverend we were looking forward all of us to that bail hearing that was supposed to take place this past monday at the uh, michigan state court of appeals in grand rapids but it looks like that that never occurred. Is that correct? Can you give us a, give us the story? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, so first of all, thank you so much for having me on your show. I, I, I tell you, without you, I don't know where I will be today. But I shouldn't say too much because I'm in prison. So, so you <laughs> understand. But uh, uh, here's here's what's important. Um, we we filed the for the appeal bond on seven six, which was uh, not this Monday but the past Monday. And what they did, it was a. Uh, uh, it, it takes about four weeks to get a hearing, uh, four to five weeks. Uh, the ACLU filed on the tenth. They filed a, a, a amicable brief for me on the tenth, requesting that I be given a bond. Um, so uh, we're working extremely hard to get it. Uh, there was no scheduled hearing for Monday. Uh, uh, the, the 13th, there was no schedule hearing at all. It was just a, uh, 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 that we, the prosecutor had uh, seven days, seven seven days in order to uh, file a answer to our uh, brief for the appeal bond, which I, I can't see what they can say or what they will do. I personally don't really care, but I'm, I'm fortunate for us. Uh, even if they file 21 days afterward, they're still going to accept those. Those uh, 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 they will accept their 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 answer to our appeal for the bond. But I, I'm, we're looking at uh, four weeks, four to five weeks. Uh, I'm looking at sometime in August, and uh, to be going back down to the uh, Barron County Trial Court and to deal with them on that level. Uh, I'm excited about it. Uh, uh, I do believe that we're going to be successful at this. 
I cannot see us not being successful at this, but we, you know, uh, uh, it, it's so important that we do what we need to do. So I'm, I'm, I'm feeling good about it, Wes. I'm, I'm feeling so good about it. And, uh, and what's even more important, we have to get the publicity out there because they're going to be fouling. Whenever they foul, they're going to have the corporate media behind them, and they're going to use, try to use their spin in order to keep me from getting that appeal bond. So uh, that's why it's so and so important. If you know anyone in Webster who's willing to write a story, we need to flood it all over the Internet. We need to send it to Italy, England, all over the world so people can know about what's going on here in America and let them know that, you know, that you know, we have a major problem uh, with this system, especially in Barrentown, which is operating, operating a criminal enterprise. So, Webster, I'm excited today, and I'm, I'm feeling good about this. I'm just being patient, and I'm just trying to take this thing just one day at a time. I'm not trying to push it. I, I did a lot of legwork. I got it, you know, got it to where we could work on it, and we worked on it as a team to make sure that uh, we'd be successful. And uh, I'm good. I'm really, really good about this. So uh, I'm just trying to do some of the things that need to be done and stay focused, don't get sidetracked, uh, and, and, and just, just do what needs to be done. So I, I'm feeling good. Also, I have some other news for you before we before you ask you any questions in reference to that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Aramark is no longer here. They're out, they're out of here. They brought in a company named Trinity, which you might want to do some research on. I don't know where Trinity came from. I have no idea who they are, what they are, but I believe they, they could be a subdivision of Aramark. We don't know because uh, we don't have computers in here to, to, to research on them, find out where they came from and what they're going to do. But I, I'm, I'm, I will suspect that they will be no better than Aramark. So, uh, well, anybody, well, let me change that because anybody could be better than Aramark. But let's, uh, 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 um, let, let's see where that goes. But, I'm, you know, I'm still here. I'm staying focused, doing the things that need to be done, and willing to take this thing to a whole different level to show the people out there that we can win this battle because we're fighting, we're fighting, and I'm, my goal is to fight until the end. I don't have no intentions of backing down. And even though I might be in here, I'm fighting on the inside, trying to get things done for the people, because it's all about the people. It's not about Reverend Edward Pinkney. I'd like to come home as soon as possible, but, hey, we're fighting a war. This is no conflict, and we have to make sure people understand exactly what it is, because we have to hold all these elected officials. It's our, okay. it's our constitutional duty to hold these people uh, accountable for their actions and do what needs to be done and take this thing to a whole different level. and. Uh, uh, for all the things that they have done to to try to stop me, me as a human being, we must continue to fight Webster. I will not stop. I will not give up. I will not quit. And I'm not a quitter, and I have no intention of quitting. So, Webster, if you have some questions you want to Absolutely. Ask. Look, Reverend, we will, uh, we will put our people to work, and we'll find out about Trinity, and we'll try to get you that. Uh, the, the thing I wanted to ask you was, the hope had been that the bail bond hearing would be at an appeals court in Grand Rapids, outside of that that company town, right? That mafia that runs uh, Benton Harbor and and Berrien County. But if I've understood correctly, you're going to be back in Berrien in uh, August in four four weeks or five weeks. That is correct. That is correct. It will. It will not be. Uh, it, uh, the bond hearing will be in Barron County, and not uh, Grand Rapids, uh, because uh, Barron County is the person that have to issue the um, the bond. So we're good with that. Absolutely. Okay. Now let's also. Uh, you mentioned media. We do try to get media. And everybody out there can get media, right? Everybody out there can be social media, as we, we put a, an appeal on the website last week uh, in, in that regard. But the other thing, of course, is money, right? So here we have to talk about lawyers, fees, all this stuff costs money. And the, the address is BH Banco, Benton Harbor Black Autonomy Network Community Organizations.org. So BH, B A N C O dot org. Make a contribution. There's a PayPal. Please do it. Absolutely. And, 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 and Webster, I, I want everybody to know 
we definitely need some media attention. We we need we we doing great on the radio, and but we we need to let them know we need some of that corporate media, uh, the Associated Press. Uh, we know we can we can get probably get them, but we probably never get the New York Times. We're trying to get the ACLU to to uh, uh, do what they normally do. They they normally file a uh, a press release. They haven't filed one yet on this. And uh, uh, if Mike Steinberg was you know was still in charge, he probably would have already filed one or something like that. But I'm I'm excited and uh, I'm I'm trying to move in the right direction. Just trying to do the things that need to be done. And staying focused and, and and taking care of the business that needs to be taken care of. Sure thing. So and, that, uh, that, that, uh-huh. so, so that's good. And everything is well. And uh, uh, and like I said, it's going to be. Uh, I'm looking at four weeks, four weeks uh, uh, from from July 6th uh, 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 when they'll they'll make the announcement that uh, uh, that. I have received a PO bond and, and will be going back down to the trial court for a hearing. So they, so that that that's my my basic goal. That's where I'm going. That's what I, I uh, uh, I'm, I'm doing, and that's what I need to do. Okay. And how are things otherwise? Otherwise, I'm here and I'm surviving and uh, 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 trying to you know try not to eat too much food uh, of their food. I try not to eat none if I can and just try to stay healthy as I can until I can get out of here. So, uh, uh, you know, the condition is is, is, is what it is. Uh, 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 this is an entirely different level for a concentration camp than anything else. And uh, okay. uh, basically that that's what it is. Reverend, I'm sorry we got this, this automatic thing coming in now with the music. Well, if you're still there, we're going to be back to you as fast as we can. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C. It's the uh, afternoon of Friday, the 17th of July. Let's do a couple of administrative uh, items, first of all. As you heard in the uh, interview with Stanislav Bishak, he is the author of the best book by all odds on what happened in Maidan, right, about the question of the rebirth of fascism in Ukraine. So we'll try to have a link to that on uh, tarpley.net so that you can just get this book for free, download it in English, illustrated, all for free. That's important. Uh, We should also, if possible, get this footage, which uh, thanks to Internet Archives and the, the Wayback Machine, you can get the BBC original coverage of the eyewitnesses near Torres in Ukraine, I guess they, the BBC would say, but in our book, it's the Donetsk People's Republic. Those eyewitnesses saying, yeah, there were two planes. And then there's an attempt to uh, the, the attempt to spin that, right? It, 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 since they're, it's obvious that there were two planes uh, or more, that um, the I think it's the Australians tried to say, well, yeah, of course, but uh, the rebels still... Uh, did the shooting. So this, of course, does not follow in any way, shape, or form. We just, just in the last um, 24, 48 hours, we've had uh, CNN saying, yeah, the report is not there, but, uh, you know, it's not public, but we got leaks from the report and they blame it on the rebels and the Russians. And uh, I think Russia today has already uh, refuted that uh, story. So, as Stanislav Pishak says, watch out for the rush to judgment. This is all a big uh, fraud. Um, so let's uh, let's have those two points. And remember, to do something to help Reverend Pinckney, you want to go to bhbanco, B-H-B-A-N-C-O dot org. Scroll down a little bit on the right. There's a PayPal. Make a contribution to the legal defense of uh, Reverend Pinckney. Remember— Big insight we have is that the uh, prosecution strategy is simply to grind down the forces favorable to freedom and liberty and anti-austerity in this case, to grind us down and to uh, you have a war of attrition and above all financial warfare, right? In the legal arena where all of this stuff costs so much. And if people know something about this trinity, um, uh, send it on in, right? Tax Wall Street Party at gmail.com, Tax Wall Street Party at gmail.com if you have any interesting uh, tidbits about that. Now, 
Let's let's look at a very uh, an extraordinary statement, really, and this is coming from the president of the U European Council, the Council of Europe, and this is the former president of Poland, Donald Tusk. Tusk, I guess, in uh, Polish would be more like it. But he is a top uh, Eurogarch, and we find him saying some, some rather interesting things. Tusk says that there is a danger, or he sees Europe splitting into two ideological camps. And, uh, of course, over austerity. In other words, that austerity is the great issue of the age. That's already bad for the austerity ghoul. They would like they would like something else to be the issue of the age, right? Maybe the clash of civilizations. The clash of civilizations was invented precisely to make sure that austerity or no austerity would not become the main issue of the age. So, uh, according to this uh, Frankfurter Allgemeine, right, flagship house organ of the uh, austerity ghoul international. Uh, they say uh, Tusk warned about an ideological split of Europe. And he says, he goes on to say, this is still Tusk, as in 1968, there is a widespread dissatisfaction with the existing arrangements, which could quickly turn into a revolutionary mood. I stress revolutionary mood. This is something important. As in 1968, there is a widespread dissatisfaction with existing conditions, and this could quickly turn into a revolutionary mood. Tusk goes on. The illusion is being... Uh, awakened or created, that there's an alternative to the existing economic system and that you could have an economy without austerity and without limits. <laughs> Tusk singled out, uh, among others, and not, not least, the uh, American uh, Nobel Prize winner in economics and austerity uh, opponent, Paul Krugman, and his quote, this, the quote from Tusk is, what Krugman is saying is certainly intellectually brilliant, but has nothing to do with reality. Well, I would say to Tusk, why don't you pick on somebody your own size? Say, me, uh, I am the principal theoretician of anti-austerity in this case, and far more radical. I have been working far more to create this uh, dissatisfaction with existing conditions, which indeed could and should become a revolutionary mood, there is an alternative to the existing system of finance capital, the neoliberal uh, or monetarist or austerity-based uh, economic system, a service economy, uh, a, a, a rubble field, post-industrial, de-industrialized, unable to maintain services. Uh, and of course, if we go back to something that looks like the industrial capitalism of earlier eras, but certainly industrial capitalism, not finance capitalism as we've got it today, not the rule of the finance oligarchs, but a society based on production and expansion Economic growth, but real economic growth, not the kind they talk about. Rising standards of living, full employment, rising wages, diminishing the uh, income inequality, but doing so in a way where the entire uh, living standard of the society, the standard of living in the society has to be improved. And that means capital intensive. It means technology intensive. It's uh, based on scientific discovery technology, industrial modernization, and, and infrastructure. We're going we're gonna to talk a little bit more about President Tusk here in a minute on World Crisis Radio. 
Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley here in uh, Washington, D.C. So President Tusk, and it's, this is worth repeating, uh, there is an ideological split in Europe. As in 1968, there's a widespread dissatisfaction with existing conditions, which can quickly turn into a revolutionary mood. The illusion is being created that there's an alternative to the uh, cur current uh, economic system without austerity. Yes, that's it. And without limits or uh, something of this sort. So Tusk says uh, Krugman is on the wrong track. Well, uh, Krugman is all well and good, but he doesn't have a program and he's not organizing as far as I can see. So uh, Krugman, fine, but uh, there's... <laughs> There's much, much worse from Tusk's point of view coming his way. Now, he also, uh, Tusk, he says, uh, we're talking too much about dignity and uh, people getting, uh, you know, degraded uh, in, in a, this is a discussion with several European newspapers, among them the flagship Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. Uh, and and then he, he tries to be a philosopher of history. Uh, history, and especially German history, uh, shows us where that leads. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, what we need is the American system of political economy. And that can, uh, that can provide rising standards of living. It makes all austerity completely counterproductive uh, and, and worse. And, and we don't need it. So... Um, Watch out for that 1968 mood that could become uh, revolutionary. So the again, the austerity block is split. I think um, Michael Ciotinas um, may be too pessimistic. Um, we should be looking again Tsipras, right? Having played the U.S. against Merkel, having played France against Germany, having created this French-Italian front against. Uh, Germany. The IMF is making demands on Schäuble. The even the Eurogarchs, right? The Brussels bureaucracy. Um, uh, Tsipras has managed to default on the loan for the IMF for the first time uh, by a European country in uh, recent times. Now, it's clear that if Tsipras had not done this, uh, then it would be impossible to reflate the banking system. But if you want to prepare it, and this is what I urge Syriza to do. If you're going to stay in the government now, use your time. Do two things. Prepare the drachma option on a stealth basis. Let's <laughs> get that money printed. Get everything ready to go. Get people trained above all. Education. And education means educate the specialists who would have to go into the Bank of Greece when you seize it and take it over and run it. And 0% credit for housing, for infrastructure and for millions of jobs to uh, safeguard the future of the Greek economy. You have, of course, got to look at where you're going to get your exports in the first three months or so. Right? That's going to be critical while you're putting the new system together. If you're forced out of the euro, big if, but you've got to have it ready. If you have it ready, it's a deterrent, and maybe it's less likely that you'll have to do it. If you don't have it ready, you can be dealt with much more brusquely, uh, and that means maybe it's going to be more likely that you get uh, get ousted. So, do political economy education, educate teams of specialists, and at the same time, educate the general public about the evils of this privately owned central banking system, of which the European Central Bank is an example. Why the Bank of Greece has to become a bureau of the Greek finance ministry and function according to public law, not according to committees of bankers, unelected, faceless, unaccountable, meeting secretly in oak paneled rooms. No way. Uh, Greek politics uh, divided now between the Erfüllungspolitiker and the nicht Erfüllungspolitiker. And in, the, in Weimar Germany, in the 20s especially, you had the fulfillment politicians, which meant pay the Versailles reparations, and the other ones who say no. Uh, however, it's not that simple, because deception in conditions like this, strategic deception, the famous Maskirovka, is essential. You can't get along without it. So uh, there's also... 
the Byzantine heritage, right? uh, the idea that um, you can be uh, more astute, let's say, than your uh, than your uh, opponents. Let's also just go back to uh, to one thing, right? The Hermann Müller government in Weimar, Germany, 1931. And you remember, this was a dispute about unemployment insurance. And the reactionary camp, which was large, came forward saying, we want to cut the unemployment insurance precisely at the moment when it's most needed. And a big fight inside the Social Democratic Party, this Social Democratic Party you see today. Um, the Hermann Miller government fell, and this was what, March, April 1931? And the problem was, it was obviously very bad, unacceptable to allow a cut to the unemployment system. But in retrospect, it might have been much better. I think it would have been better to accept the cut and stay in power, provided that your your faction, provided that the members of your caucus, your members, have been educated to the point of understanding, maintaining political power in politics is the equivalent of maintaining the initiative in military terms. And if Miller had been able to stay in power a little bit longer, it might have been very different. As it was, what did you get? Well, Miller fell, and that was the last majority government in Weimar, Germany, until Hitler. And that was at gunpoint after purging uh, the communists and, and all kinds of other uh, horrendous crimes. So after Miller, you essentially get uh, two, uh, a year, a year or two of um, the uh, Bruning government, and uh, and after Bruning, it's you know von Schleicher and von Papen and uh, and Hitler. So a lot of people who went through that said it was a mistake to surrender control of the government with all that that means in terms of coups, destabilizations, uh, uh, arrests, frame-ups, everything like this, non-ability to do foreign policy. It was a mistake to surrender control of the government at that point over an issue which was admittedly very, very serious, yes, but somehow you had to do more. And we've talked about the Brest-Litovsk uh, example, right? If Lenin had said, well, <laughs> this is hopeless, we might as well go home, then no Soviet Union, then think a little bit further. Things would not have been uh, so great. So we would, uh, would look at that, that Miller government as a, uh, as a good example of uh, what's, what's wrong with this. I guess it's, it's 1930 that the, that the Miller government fell. It's the spring after the crash of 1929. And uh, again, that's the last majority government. In Greece today, that would be Tsipras is out, suppose, and no government can be formed. That will lead to a government of technocrats. It might lead to a peacekeeping force. It might lead to foreign occupation. And how about Turkey? How about the adventurer Erdogan of the Muslim Brotherhood, who says, well, uh, we want Thrace, right? We want that area in northwest, uh, northeast Greece that really belongs to us Turks, right? What's going to stop that? So you've got to, you, and if you want to stop it, you better have a pretty good alliance with Russia. So if you're going to do that, you better have the foreign ministry. So there are a lot of other things in the realm of political economy that have got to be uh, taken into account. So 38 of 149 Syrizas uh, broke the phalanx, in my view. They broke the shield wall, and uh, out they go. Back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio, our last segment, the 17th of July, 2015. Um, Maria Finoshina, uh, the war correspondent of RT, uh, has been traveling from South Carolina to Georgia to Alabama, uh, investigating the question of the Confederate flag. And I'm afraid uh, Maria Finoshin has been doing some rather softball interviews, may we say. Uh, today she was on with a Confederate lady who runs a Confederate flag plant. She says, this is heritage. This has nothing to do with slavery. This has everything to do with states' rights. Well, I'm sorry. That's baloney. 
take a look at tarpley.net, a couple of uh, 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 spaces down the page. And scroll down, you'll find the cornerstone interview of Confederate Vice President Alexander Stevens, where he says, this entire enterprise is based on slavery. United States says all men are created equal. We know better, says this uh, Alexander Stevens. We know better. They're all radically unequal, and therefore Stevens for white supremacy. Uh, Maria Finoshina, having been interviewed by her myself, uh, in Libya and in some other places, uh, she needs to get up to speed on that. How about the Confederate Constitution? How about the fact that slavery is, is declared untouchable? You can't legislate against slavery according to the Confederate Constitution. You'd have to have a constitutional uh, amendment. So it's slavery, slavery, slavery. And don't let anybody tell you otherwise. It's time also to get Jeff Davis Highway shut down, right? This guy does not enjoy the cult, which Robert E. Lee wrongly uh, enjoys. So uh, so there we go with that. Obama is the first president to visit a prison. It's interesting. Um, and and not not the worst. Uh, now, let's talk about the Iran deal. This is uh, this is very important. Uh, we want to get started, start the discussion today and uh, and keep it up. Please take a look at Topley.net. You will find the uh, interview that I did or the debate I took part in on Press TV of Iran on the day that this was announced. And uh, I'm very much in favor of this. I believe in diplomacy, war avoidance. Uh, it's a very agreeable surprise to see this coming from the the uh, Obama administration. What it all shows is that the reactionary bigots, hate mongers, austerity ghouls of the Republican Party, they're much worse than Obama. Why do you waste your time attacking Obama when you have those monsters? And in particular, maybe the worst scoundrel of the lot, Tom Cotton, senator from Arkansas. This is the guy who said, oh, a war with Iran would just take a couple of days. Good. You, you get out there, Cotton. We'll have you and the neocon brigade in the first, the first rank. And remember, neocons are running the foreign policy apparatus of every one of the 16 that we can, we can see so far. Um, the idea that Netanyahu and his deputy prime minister would openly announce that they're planning a high-profile interference in U.S. internal affairs is an unfriendly act, as was the meddling of Obama in uh, meddling with Obama by Netanyahu against Obama in the uh, joint session of Congress. These are institutional facts that cannot be uh, neglected. Now, we have the Chattanooga gunman. We have this guy Abdulaziz, uh, originally the family I guess from Kuwait. And uh, it turns out now that this Abdul Aziz, according to Reuters, has traveled to Yemen and to Jordan. Now, anybody who goes to Yemen gets on a watch list. It is clear this was between April and November of last year. So he would have been hobnobbing with Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Right? That's Yemen. AQAP. That would be the heirs of Al Laki, the CIA lackey. <laughs> That means, of course, that this guy was very much on the screen of the FBI and other agencies. It looks to me like this is a patsy and that this shooting is, in effect, the opening salvo carried out by the enemies of the Iran nuclear accord to try to shut down that accord. And, of course, it makes no sense because these this has got nothing to do with Iran uh, in, in Yemen, but they're going to try somehow to spin it. And remember, at this point, any false flag event coming out of the Middle East that's pinned on Iran, don't believe it. Just don't believe it. Discount that in advance. Inoculate yourself and others against this uh, idiotic uh, idea that, that somehow Iran would choose this moment to do something in the area of uh, false flag uh, operations. They, they won't uh, do that. So otherwise, we would congratulate um, President Rouhani of Iran. We would congratulate Foreign Minister uh, Raviz, Raziv for uh, his uh, work there. And uh, we're agreeably surprised that even Skull and Bones Kerry comes around to this. 
uh, and that Obama uh, does so. Uh, this is all uh, highly interesting. Now, if we could just get Obama to bring more reasonableness to the table in the really big one, the Russian uh, dossier, right, the Russian-Ukrainian dossier, then uh, we would uh, be in, in much better shapes. So that's the, uh, the task we all uh, have uh, cut out for us. Now, uh, Scott Walker has joined the Republican presidential campaign. And as I said uh, in many broadcasts before, Scott Walker fulfills the dictionary definition of a fascist. He is uh, a union buster, an austerity monger, and he is a uh, an authoritarian uh, figure. Unfortunately, the Wisconsin court intimidated or bought, right? Maybe they were bought by Koch or somebody. Uh, we're told that uh, Walker's uh, dirty dealings in the recall campaign of 2012 have now been uh, approved by uh, by these people, this Wisconsin court. Remember what it comes down to. The Republican nomination is going to be Jeb Bush and Wall Street, that is to say CIA Bush and Wall Street, or Christie or Walker, uh, something like this, I think, at the present time, in the sense that Walker has actually been a union-busting goon plug-ugly. The thing about Christie is Christie is better equipped to play one on TV. He's better equipped to go on television with his pugnacious mug and get on there and break a strike or make some kind of blood-curdling speech, which is supposed to scare somebody out in the world, most likely uh, Putin. Well, it won't work. Uh, but this is, this is the level of scheming uh, at which the U.S. ruling class uh, operates. And that brings me to one of my constant themes. You will not get a happy ending for the U.S. out of any of these things unless and until the bankrupt, incompetent ruling class that we have is ousted. Now, of course, this is, they're not even the worst, right? We see that the Eurocrats and the Eurogarchs are, in, in many ways, worse. But the level of incompetence uh, in the United States is magnified by the fact that this is a more powerful state still. So when you multiply the powerful state times the absolute bungling incompetence, of the ruling elite, uh, you get a, a very, very bad result. There is the, Obviously, it's a transatlantic crisis of the ruling class, where the, the European one is more graphic and immediate, but where if we compare the U.S. advantages to what they're able to obtain, over here, the level of incompetence is also very, very high. So if you're not willing to get into that, uh, it's not going to work. So um, I would urge people... Uh, don't become a face in the crowd for Bernie Sanders, since that seems to be it, right? The Washington Post is reporting today, Friday the 17th, that Bernie Sanders is getting huge crowds. Well, uh, don't be a face in the crowd for Bernie Sanders. I get something better in your 2016 uh, election cycle. See you next week on World Crisis Radio.